This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on October 29th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, as promised... We have Erling Norby back for part two. Welcome back, Erling. It's a great pleasure to be back. We last saw each other in Sweden. That was in August. True. A couple of months ago. It and was a great experience. It was wonderful. I had a great time. And um, now you're visiting the U.S. And as we promised back then, we would do a TWIV. So here we are. So you're here on a two-week tour, right? Three weeks. Three. Tour. Three weeks. It's really a book tour to celebrate your fourth book, right? It's true. It, it, it provides a lot of exciting material and a nice to share, and that's what we do. The fourth book is about cancer, right? And Nobel so as Prizes. the title says, it's about cancer, vision, and the genetic code. Okay. So these are the prizes in physiology or medicine in 1966, 67, and 68. And mm -hmm. So you can, you can see the content on the book on the cover now. All right. So we're at Columbia University, we're in my office, and it is Tuesday. And uh, Erling yesterday gave a seminar at Rockefeller University about Nobel Prizes for cancer and cancer viruses, cancer-causing viruses. And I went to hear that, and it was lovely. Rockefeller is an amazing place. Oh, it's, it's my uh, second home in, in here in, in, in New York, so to say. No. And today you gave a talk here about uh, Nobel Prizes and the genetic code. And I was really excited to see two people who were connected with Marshall Nuremberg, who was awarded the prize, one third of the prize, I guess, for the genetic code in 68, uh, here at your seminar. Yeah, it was a very uh, surprise and a joy to me. His second wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, Myrna, I've written about her in the book and the appendix. She meant a lot of him when his wife had died of Alzheimer's and, 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 and not mm. the last, whatever they had, eight, ten years together. I think we were very rich. Wow. And then a trainee of his who is now a faculty member here. Yes. A neuroscientist. And she was telling you how after the code he went into neuroscience, right? That is correct. <laughs> so he had a, a man full of ideas and on the... And, uh, but in, in this particular project of trying to study the brain in cell culture, right. it, it, it's a pretty daunting challenge. And, and he was trying yeah. a lot of things. Uh, but to be honest, uh, so far, and, and I understand, no, no major breakthroughs. She said something interesting that she said he always thought there was a code. What did she call it? A synaptic code? A mm -hmm. code for the nervous system. And for years... We didn't understand that, but she said, now we realize there are many codes in the nervous system. Yes, I think it uh, must be rather difficult to try to draw any kind of analogies mm. between the genetic code and the, and the neural code. The genetic code, by definition, has this very strict uh, nature, sure, and, and, sure. Uh, and that made it such a beautiful prize because once it was complete, it was complete. Nothing could be added, nothing could be right. uh, did, 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 did retracted from that's it. That's right, that's right. One more thing I wanted to ask you um, before we start talking about science. You had a book release in October at the Nobel Museum. Mm -hmm. How did that go? So it was a lot of fun. It was a kind of mixed audience. I mean, I had some of my relatives there, you know, mm -hmm. my whole family, children and grandchildren, colleagues from before, but also other people that I enjoy interacting with. So I, I gave it, an, uh, uh, it, it is a rather popularized version. And I even sang a part in there, mm -hmm. uh, because in that, in those, in the, when you read the book, you'll see that that the students uh, in the in various parts of Stockholm University they take alternative responsibility for for the Nobel laureates at the after the whole large feast and then in the city hall, and then there's an entertainment and so they uh, 
developer that they that makes songs that are uh, focused on the particular pricing in question and, and mm-hmm. uh, it uh, it's it's good student fun well for your next book i will come so i get that question and my last picture when i had the book release it was of course that that uh, yes <laughs> uh, health permitting i'd be happy to get going Mm-hmm. With the new book, I can see the coming three three years. That is sixty nine, seventy, seventy one. Very interesting themes. Sixty nine is in fact bacteriophages, which is virology. Oh, so then we could discuss Delbrück, Kirsch, and Luria, and then it, it's it's uh, so, uh, southern and and of course the um, uh, the cyclic AMP and so forth. Mm-hmm. And then it's a neurobiology again. So. The, so next year, 2020, will be the 50th anniversary of the 1970 prize, right? Yeah, so what happens is that it is January, the year after okay. the 50 years have passed, that the archives are made available. So 2021 for uh, the 1970 prize. And, and is it made available in January of that yeah. year? Mm-hmm. So then you need to uh, apply to go, and then you have access and you start studying. That's right. I make a new application every year saying that I would like to study this and and, and I get uh, permission to do that. So let's start by picking up where we left off. Uh, We had last time we talked, we finished with uh, uh, Manot Jacob de Voff. And there was a person connected with them, I think, Leo Zillard. I wanted to read something you wrote. You wrote, he was a dedicated nonconformist. He did not mind offending anybody, but never committed the sin of being boring. He had one principle which he did not violate on any occasion, never say what was expected of him. And you end uh, by saying, so one may ask, where are the Sillards of today? <laughs> you know, this idea of never being boring. Jim Watson had a book yeah, called... Exactly. Uh, avoid boring people. Avoid bo- boring other people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you meet Zillard ever? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, Zillard, I didn't meet. No, and he, uh, you know, he is uh, one of those Hungarians who moved out to uh, Hungary the, uh, at the time of the f- the first and between the first and the second World War, and yeah. and and these are remarkable group of people, and he's one of them with an extraordinary intellect. Of course, he's best known for his involvement in the development of the the atom bomb. He, right. I mean, he, he, right. he conceived the concept, uh, actually, as he said, when he was standing at a, at a street crossing and, and seeing the shift of the, of the light that allowed him to pass across, across the, the road. And why that inspired him, I don't know, but, but mm-hmm. he, that, that uh, uh, made him uh, understand that here was something unique. Uh, but he was involved in so many different things. And uh, But when the Manhattan Project got started, he was well informed about that. And it was together with Einstein that he formulated this letter to uh, to Roosevelt that really initiated the whole pro- process. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, yeah, it was extraordinary, it was his intellect. And then he got involved in reflecting on biological uh, matters. And they interacted quite a lot with Mono. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, that had to do with gene regulation. And what he emphasized, among other things, was that it's not only positive regulation, also be negative regulation, that are two sides of the thing. And, and, and he, I think he was, was very helpful when uh, Jacob and Mono developed their whole concept of gene regulation by various feedback mechanisms. Are there any uh, Zillards today that we know of? I'm sure there are in terms of uh, intellects of that uh, magnitude. Uh, question is how do you stimulate them to get involved in science? Mm. How do you identify them? But uh, by, by definition, that must uh, certainly, they must exist. It's a question of identifying and make them interested in science and not in something else. They, they, yeah. they, they, I think sometimes we have these very gifted children that are understimulated in sc- school and they lo- li- may lose contact and, and not really use their resources. We have to identify them. And uh, 
make sure that they are stimulating so that they not, not, don't get bored. I would say that Richard Feynman would fit the category. Oh, yes, yes. Never boring, always brilliant, I think. No, the, that another aspect, as I said, there's this various kinds of, of, of jokes, the way you can have a contrast to uh, the, the, the deep involvement in thinking about a particular problem. And, and we have many highly qualified scientists that are gestures. I would like to mention Sidney Brenner. I mean, yes. he, he uh, almost in every situation where he could apply that, he uh, used to the f- formulate some kind of, kind of pranks. And, 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 and mm. it keeps a distance of that. And as you know, Arthur Köstl has written about uh, the, 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 what, what, what is just the sense of humor? What is, was it a joke? And he, he talked about this bisection process and, and uh, that it can lead to many different things. Synthesis, of course, is how you aggregate and add the information. But if they are on collision course and you can't resolve it, it's like yeah. precipitately like a joke. Sure. And, uh, and uh, I like this analogies that are, uh, how you try to uh, manage to, uh, to quite challenging processes that you want to, uh, is, is it to, to compare in some way. Yeah, I, I would say Brenner would be another in that mold for sure. He was never, never boring. No, it was never. A, yeah. And whenever he stayed in a hotel, it was, of course, a, hot, a room with a view. Or you. Right, that's what he always said that, yep. Okay, let's go to the the cancer prizes now. 1966, Peyton Rouse for the first tumor virus. Tell us a little of the story. You told this yesterday, but hmm? tell us no, what happened. No, I'm happy to. It is a very, very interesting story and quite unique, actually. So, um, Rouse, uh, he had a background training at, at the Johns Hopkins and uh, and he apparently was an, more of an experimentalist than someone who wanted to do clinical medicine even though he was uh, supervised by, by Osler who really developed uh, clinical medicine in, in, in this country. Uh, but he was stimulating to do pathology and he also had a, a short period in Germany when he learned about the, the, the high, st- high quality German pathology, which you uh, learned to know. And uh, then he started to do some experiments with the cerebral spinal fluid and the cells in, in this, this fluid. And, and apparently, good quality work, so we could publish that in articles in Journal of Experimental Medicine. And these were then seen by the, uh, the the, the the leadership at at, uh, the, at Rockefeller uh, Institute, as it was called, and he was invited to to join the staff there, and uh, and the f- a particular field which was he was encouraged to involve in was at cancer research, and it this was at a time when uh, one started to identify infectious agents that were different from the bacteria. Uh, by the criterion that they were ultra filtrable, they could pass through uh, a very fine filter. And I'm sure in these these programs, you very often met the the, the term ultra filtrable agents and so on. And um, so, simply what what uh, Ross did, he the, there was a farmer from uh, nearby uh, the, the the institute in New York who came with a, a particular. Uh, hen with had a tumor, and uh, then what Ross did was to homogenize the tumor and push it through uh, this uh, ultra filter and take out the filtrate and inject uh, other s- similar uh, a similar kind of of, of hen, and uh, he s- showed that uh, that tumor could develop, and this could be passed several times. And the character of the tumor was rather similar from one animal to the other. So, so here is clearly something that there was a good bit smaller than bacteria that could transmit s- some qualities that led to uh, development of, of, of a tumor. And uh, uh, he was inspired by this. He did it with, with several different tumors. 
uh, but uh, then beyond that, the, 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 there, there were no techniques really to, to make a more refined analysis in, in those days. This was morphological analysis with pathology and so forth. So after a few years of that, he actually left the field and also during what then followed as a, say, the First World War, uh, there are other needs, and he was involved in developing techniques to store blood and so forth. Uh, it should be uh, emphasized here that he he didn't have priority to to the use of a filtrate to induce some kind of tumor because there were two Danes, uh, Elemann and Bang, who had did similar experiments in 1908, and these are cited in uh, Rouse's first publication. However, they, they, they took, they made the filter from uh, a myeloic, myeloic leukemia in, in chicken. And in those days, it, it wasn't known that there were kind of analogous processes in developing one kind of tumor in the hematopoietic system and whatever in epithelial cells or even in, in fibroblast or sarcoma, something like that. One, one thought that the, the morphology indicated that there were very different processes. But they, they, and uh, to my knowledge, they never followed up in that early work. Now, so uh, it, it number of uh, of the of Ross colleagues, uh, they were very impressed with his work, and they started to nominate him for Nobel Prize. The first one was Landsteiner, who uh, mm -hmm. used to emphasize as one of the giants in science, and he, of course, he got his Nobel Prize in 1930 for uh, identifying the human blood groups, something of very practical importance. But way before that, he had in 1908 demonstrated that polio virus, uh, that, that polio was caused by an ultra-filtrable agent, mm -hmm. local virus, which was an, an important contribution. And later on, he, he made very pioneering contribution to the whole field of cell-mediated immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what happened was, now we look at it in the longer perspective, since Rouse did not receive his prize until in 1966, when he was 87 years old, there were many, many years over which his work was reviewed and analyzed. And it allows you uh, to use the Nobel archives to see how the, the concepts evolve and how man mm -hmm built up a larger and larger respect for that there may be viruses had something to do with tumors because in 26 when he was first nominated the pathologist Folke Henschen said that no this has no relevance to human cancer mid 1930s still no this has no relevance to human cancer in 30s the attitude started to change and for the first time in 37 uh, another pathologist and uh, uh, by name Hilding Bergstrand, he uh, emphasized that maybe this, this could be considered mm -hmm. for a Nobel Prize. And other things were also happening in the end 30s. Virology was taking on a new shape. Wendell Stanley had crystallized tobacco mosaic virus and showed that that crystals contained inf an infectious agent, which of course was a mind bogging. How could a crystal be infectious and so forth? And, and he later on got a shared Nobel Prize in chemistry. I think it was in 1946. And, uh, so that he was a true virologist that I was recognized. Also at that time, I started to, to develop the electron microscope so that for the first time, one could look at virus particles. And uh, the father of the electron microscope, Ernst Ruska, who did his developmental work in 1932-33, uh, he was interested in, in the application of the instrument to biological specimens. And he had a brother who was a physician by the name of Helmut. And he employed Helmut Ruska. And between 1938 and 42, they did some very pioneering work using the electron microscope and looking at virus particles. So now, for the first time, one could see uh, definitely that they were homogeneous, but uh, for different viruses, different shapes, large particles for what later could be cockpox virus, and there's vaccinia virus, 
Uh, and then herpes virus, a little smaller. Bacteriophages, a head and a tail was seen already in the beginning 1940s. And also some other viruses. So there were uh, five very critical publications on the structure of virus. In fact, one even proposed that, that, that maybe in the future we could classify viruses depending on the structure of the virus particle, size and appearance and so forth. So this was these were important developments. And the Bruska brothers, they managed to survive through the war and they were not incriminated in any involvement in the in the Nazi movement. So they could continue their work. And Helmut Ruska for a long time worked in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember where they were, but but here there were development now of of US uh, electron microscopes. And he used that and I think he was he got permission to move to this country under that special rule that applied, that said that that uh, survivors of of the uh, from from the war with special knowledge like Werner von Braun for example they could be given passport to work in this country because this country should take advantage mm -hmm. of the knowledge. so Helmut Ruska built up uh, uh, good ultrastructural studies in the plant. So also you mentioned yesterday that some other tumor viruses were being discovered which also gave some impetus to the Shop prize, right? Absolutely. So so what happened was that first of all in 1935 uh, uh, there was a virologist by name of, of, of Shop who studied rabbit papillomas mm -hmm. and uh, he was a good uh, pathologist and, and, and virologist but he thought that the Raus could do a better job with these viruses so he handed over that system to, to Raus. They were both at, at Rockefeller and so Raus spent a lot of time studying mm -hmm. uh, tumors caused by papilloma viruses and uh, introduced terms like progression. He, he used uh, see how you could further develop one kind of tumor by painting with tar and things of this kind. And, uh, and uh, in fact, there were a lot, lot of studies of the different steps, you know, and how uh, the tumors could uh, uh, metastasize or be transplanted and so forth. Uh, so yes, uh, that uh, was what an important development. The other thing that happened was that man, uh, in the mid thirties, one started to develop uh, the inbred mouse strains, and they uh, really served science in many different ways. But they, because they are like identical twins, you can move tissue back and forth between uh, these uh, uh, the, the, the different animals. And uh, but the, man also found in some of those strains that one had generated uh, an increased number of tumors. There was so there were like like breast cancer that was started by Joseph Bittner, and he could show that that was something transferred with the milk during lactation in the early phase of life. So that was one of the early tumors. This. And then uh, very, very quickly, as uh, one started to using the very inbred strain, one found more and more viruses, uh, which when I started to examine them in electron microscope, turned out to be uh, uh, small spherical viruses that had an envelope and uh, they were classified and called type A, type B and type C viruses. Turned out that many of the type C viruses, they uh, had oncogenic properties. They could cause different kinds of tumors. And uh, very often they were named after the, the, the investigator who was studying this. So there was Gross virus, there was a Maloney virus, there was Rauscher virus, Abelson virus, friend. and then and friend virus. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so the uh, whole, uh, whole gamut of, of different tumor viruses that were available for studies during the 1950s. And then uh, uh, Stuart and Eddie uh, who wanted to conf confirm some of gross studies which were not that were not that easy to reproduce they required certain strains and certain technical uh, the, uh, the certain design of the technique uh, they discovered a completely different virus which was polyoma virus causing many different tumors 
and was a completely different kind of, of virus. Not that it was a naked virus, and it was, as later was demonstrated, DNA virus, not an RNA virus. So a lot of things were, were happening at this time. And one can follow this in the archives there of the, for the Nobel Prize in 1961. There is a fantastic review on 36 pages by George Klein. Mm. And George Klein was of Hungarian origin, came to Sweden in the 1950s, worked with Tobion Kaspersson, and then uh, rapidly showing his uh, capacity as an experimentalist. So he became professor of tumor biology at the Karolinska Institute in 1957. And he was highly qualified to, to evaluate mm. what was happening in when it came to virus-induced cancer, and he wrote excellent reviews of that. So that provided the platform for the prize to rouse in 1966. Who else uh, received the prize that same year? So it was uh, Charles Huggins, who was an, an, uh, a surgeon, and, and that's mm. a bit... Uh, we have very few surgeons that have received Nobel Prizes, but and he had introduced something that used even into these days, namely hormone treatment of certain forms of cancer, like prostate cancer or mammary cancer. And so that observation is relevant today. And I have speculated in the book that the fact that this was uh, something of immediate clinical relevance may have served as a lever to bring forward that 1966 price, because uh, at this time, one has started to build up insight into a lot of different major scientific contributions that, that might be worthy of a prize. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, by using this term, that worthy of a prize, there were 35 different candidates or <laughs> groups of candidates. So it was quite a daunting task to the committee to come to a conclusion. And uh, I think the fact that, that this was a good combination of a, of a clinically, uh, 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 something of a high clinical relevance and also something very fundamental in okay. viruses, could cause tumors that, that brought them the price in, in uh, 66. And that indeed was due time because uh, Sir Rouse was 87 years old then. So was he the oldest recipient? He's the oldest recipient in, when it mm. comes to the price of physiology and medicine. Of course, this year we broke a lot of records for a 97-year-old prize recipient for the li <laughs> lithium battery. So he's now the oldest he's of all the, the prizes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And this so maybe we'll have a centenarian soon. You never know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> never know. However, one should emphasize <laughs> what did the Nobel say? Well, uh, he said it should be given to a prize for the, the one who during the previous year has made right. its contribution. <laughs> that has been very difficult to yeah. to to follow because, uh, or to abide with, because uh, usually one wants to have another perspective on the dis discovery, that is the key word here. And uh, so uh, I would say it's been at least five to 10 years and sometimes more before one go from the discovery to awarding a prize. And as you've mentioned, he envisioned giving it to someone in their 30s, so then they would have 20 years of salary support, right? Yeah, this was the original idea. Okay, <laughs> so Nobel was looking for that that that, uh, that young person, that thirty plus, who has really shown an advantage talent for science, and he should have a salary for twenty years. And really, uh, and remember, this this was all formulated at the time where there was no research grants, there were no uh, research, uh, um, uh, I mean, s money for salary of research, and then. Uh, it was so different from our present time. Also, now the magnitudes of the discoveries that you award for prizes are very difficult to achieve at a young age in science. In, indeed. I mean, you need to have uh, quite training for, for some time, and then you need to build up that group and, and pursue your ideas, yeah. or should we call it obsession? You may have that mm -hmm. favorite idea. And uh, and uh, to s and see if you are lucky enough to have a breakthrough, which yeah, is yeah, another yeah. matter. If you look at the the statistics, the the youngest Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine was what what Banting, who discovered insulin, and he was a prototype for for what Nobel was looking for. Second youngest was Josh Lederberg, 
who got prize in 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 58 and when he was only 33 years old and of course as a, a, a very very creative scientist and, and, and that came to mean a lot later on to development of, of our profession uh, and then 34 is uh, uh, it's Watson Jim Watson mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was Jim Watson came back to Stockholm in uh, 2004 uh, for 2012 when it was 50 years after his Nobel Prize and uh, so he had uh, this unique career and blah, blah, blah. but overall uh, the average age for prize recipients physiology and medicine is about 57 and coming up it's rising so, yeah uh, <laughs> that's where we are the, the reality that we are sure. confronted with maybe. one one aspect of Rouse's prize that you mentioned yesterday was that in the end, he really didn't understand what his virus was doing, right? No, he, yeah, he he, he didn't understand the, really the most important part of this, namely that this virus could perturb the genetic material and the function in the cell that the virus is hitting. Now he he didn't believe in that. He he, he talked about oncogenic. Uh, factors, of course, I mean, I was aware of that, and he used that in studies, development of tumor, but that the virus should in some way interact with the genetic material, it, it was not in his world of conception, and, and there is a story about Renato Dolbeck, who was asking him, so what about Lwof lysogeny findings, couldn't that be of interest in tumors, and they didn't catch on, oh, mm. he didn't. But remember, you should recall he belonged to a very different generation. Molecular genetics was not a trait. But there's of course the field where finally using Ross virus, major things were discovered. I don't know. So let's continue then with Rouse virus because mm -hmm. it was a it, it was a player in two more Nobel prizes. So when can you trace for us the the work that led to understanding? how this virus transformed cells. Yeah. So it, during the 1960s, then when I found all these tumor virus, and then the pendulum swung, uh, swung very far to the one, and I said, couldn't it be that, that all tumors are caused by viruses, that there are a endogenous uh, C-type virus particle that, that could be the cause of, of cancer? Uh, and that would, of course, be uh, very attractive. We had a unifying hypothesis for mm. development of cancer. Uh, although there was always a reservation because the, the epidemiology of cancer told very clearly that, that it, it should not be infectious. But, uh, mm. uh, as, a, as a categorical explanation. Anyhow, Jupiter and Todaro, they developed what they call the oncogene hypothesis. Not so. So Raus talked about oncogenes. Yeah, it was the carcinogenic factors, but oncogenes would be something that that viruses could carry in, in some diffuse way, uh, genetic information that would cause uh, cancers. Mm -hmm. And this had major consequences in the U.S. Uh, because uh, under Nixon's time, one built up a program which eventually, although not in, in the very extensive original form, but still a major program was, was formulated by Congress and as a cancer, conquest of cancer program. Uh, little naively, one was thinking about man on the moon project, and one thought that uh, we're going to make a crush effort, if we put a lot of money into this, we're going to solve the problem. Uh, so the, the outsets were not really very good, but a lot of money was put into this, and that improved uh, certainly a certain aspect of the way can cancer was treated. For example, in at that time, I started to have the use of of certain drugs that turned out to be quite effective in in uh, eliminate the childhood cancer and so forth. So, so progress was made, but not on the scale. And of course, no uniform form hypothesis was found, and it took way into the 70s and also into the development of of new techniques before one finally 
by use of rouse fires, and this is interesting, could identify what this was all about. What was the critical thing in rouse fires? So, uh, and at at one point you mentioned um, Temin and his mentor, who was Weintraub, right? Yeah. Uh, was that how Weintraub in San Francisco, or was it someone else who who Temin worked for and learned? Yeah, that could be. I don't can't know that story well. No, no. He he developed cell cultures. Could see foci caused by yeah, rice. or with Harry Rubin. Rubin, yes, Harry, Harry Rubin, Rubin. Sorry, Harry Rubin. Yeah, yeah, they were trying to quantify how many transforming virus particles are there, and right. and and that was an interesting technique. They had a layer of chicken fibroblast, and they got foci like a uh, like signs of tumor formation yeah. in different places right. and you could calculate the number of, right. of such foci. So, so yeah, that's, that, was, that was an important contribution. But then Temin was, had this uh, very uh, special way of, of thinking and and and, uh, uh, and there was one finding later into the 60s where uh, the, uh, well, many of us were using the drug actinomycin and actinomycin apparently cut off uh, this uh, the, the f what we later understood uh, the the functioning DNA because it, that by intercalating between DNA and RNA here and uh, so an RNA virus like Mises virus that I was studying it grew very well in the presence of actinomycin mm. but these tumor viruses did not uh, the uh, the C type tumor virus did not grow well in the presence of actinomycin why was that if it contains RNA and it should behave like any other RNA. So, so here was a, a little link, and I think that that uh, Timmy was really re reflecting on that, and that I think why he formulated that that could be some at just unidentified relationship between RNA and DNA. And it is a magnificent story how this evolved in the end of the 1960s, and published in parallel and from two different laboratories, Howard Temin uh, managed eventually to demonstrate that, that there is uh, this unique enzyme that can take copy RNA into DNA. Mm -hmm. And then David Bolton, in, in his absolutely elegant studies on, on different kinds of viruses, pure RNA viruses like poliovirus, how do they replicate? Well, they must go from plus to minus to plus because there always have to be a mold for the formation on them. And then in, 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 with, together with his wife, Alice Huang, they have another RNA virus where this doesn't work. So then it, what we later call negative strand. So then the virus might carry an enzyme with it and that minus strand becomes a plus strand and it can go back and forth and then the system is working. And, and this, 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 this mirror image of plus and minus was uh, ingenious and has actually been used even into the present time to use as a way of dividing viruses into very mm. cl crystal clear groups, depending upon what, what is the unique characteristic of the, the replication of the nucleic acid of the infant. Now, the, so the key final finding here was that also David Baltimore found, unknow uh, without knowing about Temin's work, that yes, there must be an enzyme that can take and copy from the DNA from RNA. And the reverse transcription was announced as a cancer congress in Texas in 1917. And I still remember that because I was present at the conference. It was like a, like a wildfire. I mean, it was fascinating <laughs> to see how everyone all about that. Oh, this completely changed our perspective on things. And then, so so the, the, the reverse transcripted and that we gave a price in 75. Which is not, the, not too long after the discovery. No, that was pretty, uh, it was so obvious that this was a critical finding. And we also brought in uh, Renato Dulbecco on that prize uh, because he done some very important work on, on DNA tumor viruses and how they replicate right. also. Right. So that is the 75 prize. Can I, can I interject? You? Yes, please do. I heard an interview with David Baltimore recently where he said the, the experiments took two weeks only to discover, but I knew where to look. I knew to look in the virus particle based on 
what you had just said, that the negative strand viruses have to carry the enzyme. Mm -hmm. So if an enzyme were to copy RNA to DNA, we have to look in the virus particle. Precisely. I, 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 to me, these are among the most elegant experiments ever performed in virology. And, then, and the, the strict logic that is supplied here, that this, it, it's brilliant. Yeah. I have great admiration for that. I, I would argue that reverse transcriptase has completely revolutionized many fields of science because we use it for cloning, we use it for diagnostics sure. and sequencing. Now it's used for almost every procedure. Exactly. It. It's incredible. Yeah, it is. A, and and, and uh, if Nobel was looking for a discovery, that was it, uh, obviously. Oh, so yes, the, it, yes. because we come back to this guy, what is discovery? Well, it, first of all, it should be unexpected. Mm -hmm. And it should, once it's it, it been identified, and of course, everyone said, well, that is the way it must be. And then it leads to a lot of new experimentation. So, yeah. so this is a, per, it's a perfect example of a discovery. So the, the prize was 1975, so we have to wait a while for the archives. Uh, indeed, but that is not uh, the impossible. We're talking about 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you were involved in that. So mm -hmm. you will, when the archives are open, it will be rekindling your memories, right? <laughs> uh, I, I hope I will be around to look at that. So actually, I got into the, I became professor in 1972, and I got into the committee in 1973. I think partly because my predecessor, Sven Gard, had a major influence in that committee. He, he is exceptional in that he spoke to Nobel laureates on five occasions, and, and that is... Uh, very few that have that can match that, and uh, so so. And of course, to me, it was a fantastic learning experience to be a part of this. And uh, so, yes, uh, we take one step at a time here. Mm. But but so, uh, uh, if I'm fortunate and then I can carry on writing these books, I can finally read my own reviews. Yeah, that would be fascinating because you were you were participating in that. So and, you, and maybe let's say, how could I write that? Yes, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> that that would see. be fascinating. Um, you you went to many Nobel dinners, right? But because of that, uh, yes, uh, from 1973 and onwards, mm -hmm. almost every single year until mm -hmm. to date, with so, four or five exceptions. So uh, these are in December, right? It's always on Nobel's death day, December 10. So it's coming, even though the prizes for this year have been announced already, mm -hmm. the, the dinners are, and you will be going, right? I will be going, yes, nice. absolutely. We have the, the privilege. It's the feast, globally, I think, they're, they're, they're an exceptional feast. So I, and, took a, uh, I took a tour of the uh, city hall, oh, the city where, hall. Where, where the banquet hall for the Nobel Prize, a big uh, area with the steps coming down, right? Mm -hmm. I guess they give speeches on the steps, is that right? They do do that, yes, on the, on the first platform there. And the, the guide told us you have so many square centimeters to sit, and if you're uh, special, then you have a little bit more, but not much. <laughs> I forgot which, who, who gets yeah, more. So originally, when I started to, to go to dinner, they were up in the Golden Hall. Right. And then we right. could seat about 850 people. Yeah, it's upstairs, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's upstairs and a f fantastic mosaics on the walls there. It's all that uh, and it's now used for dancing, so mm -hmm. that we dance up there. Uh, 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 but at that time, one danced on, on, on the floor in, in, in the, what's called the Blue Hall. But in the Blue Hall, we can seat about 1,350 people. So, And the pressure has been so uh, enormous. So the, the, the sure. way, since way back, we're using the... The blue hall for the, for the dinner. It's very crowded, right? <laughs> oh, it's it's well filled up. So you sit, but you, you can't move around. You just sit and listen to the proceedings. Oh, you can you can move around in him, and so it's not that jammed. Um, okay. Um, uh, but it, but it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that's that's reverse transcriptase, which was the second Nobel for exactly. Rouse. And tell us what led to the. Third Rouse virus Nobel. Yeah, so this is really very critical. And, and uh, uh, so without revealing too much uh, clearly, I, I was in, in very much involved in that prize because I addressed the two prize recipients in, 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 in 1989, and that was uh, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus. So what did they do? Well, uh, techniques had developed so one could start to really examine 
the, uh, the, the genome of viruses in various parts. And they, uh, and then there was a colleague by the name of Peter Vogt, Vog, a very respectable uh, retrovirologist who had found a strain of Rouse virus that could replicate but could not transform. Mm -hmm. So that immediately suggested that the transforming part was not absolutely essential for virus replication, but that's a matter. And then the uh, uh, Bishop and Varmus had access to this virus by the generosity of, of this colleague. I mean, that's the way science should work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we share yeah. reagents and so on. <laughs> and uh, they started to develop, uh, uh, and Harold Varmus had learned a little about hybridization techniques at NIH. So they started to develop tools by which they wanted to look uh, in Rouse virus, but, but, but the source of this uh, extra genetic material so that was not needed for replication. And in the critical experiment, uh, one could find that, that this DNA had its origin in the cell. So the virus carried along a piece of cellular DNA, and that was, of course, a dramatic finding. And from there on, man could then start to map up more carefully what, what kind of gene is this? Is it present in all cells? Turned out it's present in all cells. And it was called, uh, referred to as an, an oncogene. And uh, uh, man could uh, then l later on identify that it had special enzymatic activities and a kind of enzymatic activities that are critical for, for signaling. So finally, one could appreciate that the way the Ross virus works is that, that accidentally, uh, and, and or the harmless form of this virus from the, uh, the chicken had picked up a host cell structure that when it was carried over into normal healthy cell, it could lead to transformation. And from there on, the whole field exploded. Oncogenes were searched for and found in many different contexts, several different functions. And already in, the, uh, in Bishop's Nobel lecture, I have, you can have a table with some 20 of them, and today we know more than 30. So, so this really opened up and clearly highlighted that the fact that the Rouse never understood, namely that the role of the virus is to carry over genetic material, which is then from the cell, which is then critical for transformation. That, that was, that was found. And then this whole field has just kept on growing. I mean, we could talk for, for hours about how the, the cancer field has evolved and what we have learned about what kind of genetic changes can lead to an irregular and uncontrolled division of cells, cells that can, once they get up in numbers, can form blood vessels, can mm -hmm. then also metastasize to other parts of the body. They, there are, of course, many different steps in this, and we are uh, still today learning more and more about this uh, new techniques, deep genomic sequencing, very helpful, the most important thing in this is, I think, that for the first time now, we have started to find ways of blocking the tumor cell replication. Mm -hmm. There is a number of important drugs that have been discovered because one had learned to know about this mechanism. Sure. And there is also and, and one, another very important field, uh, and that is the field of immunology, where one has really managed to find ways of exploiting the, the immune system to prevent the development of tumor. And last year we gave a Nobel Prize uh, for these new techniques uh, of using an immunological treatment, which as a consequence uh, allows us to manage about 30% of all melanomas, 30% of all lung cancers. So what was one? And, uh, and, and still is, of course, a scaring disease, but it was an, a disease that could not manage. It's now a scaring disease, but with many possibilities to, to, to be managed with all the knowledge that we have. Yeah. Right. Now, you mentioned you addressed 
1989 recipients. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So, uh, uh, as we in, in, there is an introduction of the prize recipients. So we gave about a three-minute talk, trying to summarize the major achievements, mm -hmm. and then we finished that. With, uh, so it's all in Swedish, and then we finish that with a full sentence in the English, where we ask the, the, the prize or the award is to step forward and receive the prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. I see. So this happens at the banquet in the city hall, right? Uh, and no, no, this happened in, in the concert hall, in the prize ceremony. So right. let's make this clear. First of all, so the, the way what happened on December 10th is that that everyone we gather in the concert hall in Stockholm, okay. dressed up in tails and, and, and everything. And then there is this prize ceremony, a prize ceremony that starts with the, the chairman of the, of the board of the Nobel Foundation, gives a welcome speech. And um, these days it's normally given in, in English, although I... Uh, being a little of a purist, we, we really like to be it in, Swe in Swedish because that's our native tongue. And uh, and then uh, there's the music pieces, and then when the, there's someone that addresses the prizes in physics, and then, then they receive the prizes from the king, and then uh, an address to the prize in chemistry, and they receive the prizes, then there's some intervening music performance and then the prize in physiology of medicine and it runs through this uh, until finishing off with the prize in literature and and there's also an attachment of a non-nobel prize in economical sciences that are it's awarded mm -hmm. during this ceremony and then when are the nobel addresses given so uh, and then so this this whole ceremony, prize ceremony, uh, finishes off uh, when you have awarded all the prizes. Then you go over bus to the city hall. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think what you're thinking of at, towards the end of the dinner, the prize recipients have an opportunity, uh, one of them representing the particular prize group, physics, chemistry, and physiology and medicine. He uh, gets given to a very short three minute speech. Mm -hmm. So the, the Nobel addresses that you can find published, uh, those are not formally given anywhere, or okay. So, so that's important. Uh, so, it says that, and and and, and in order to get the prize, you should, should give, uh, uh, or when you have received your prize, the, the requirement is that you give a Nobel lecture. Lecture, right? And in the early days, when I was involved in this, we we. Uh, stayed with this arrangement. So first people received their prizes, and then two days later, they gave their Nobel lectures. Nobel lectures are given in different places. Uh, I have it in, uh, in physiology medicine, of course, it's at the Karolinska Institute, and uh, in other localities for the other prizes. So one should give a Nobel lecture. Little, uh, so I guess we get into the to the 70s or or little, little later, the 80s, uh, one just with consideration to the prize recipient, one allowed them to give their Nobel lecture before they get the prize. So this is the procedure we have today. Okay. okay. So during that Nobel week, uh, they give their lectures and then it's kind of finishing off with the uh, Nobel Prize ceremony and, and the events okay. in the city. But there's one more thing, and mm -hmm. that is... The fairy tale event on December 11, mm -hmm. which is a dinner in the royal castle. <laughs> and I tell you, I've seen many uh, uh, American colleagues that are just uh, am amazed by the, the whole mm -hmm. atmosphere that, that is created in that, that, in the castle. It's a fantastic dinner that, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, in, in a unique, uh, high quality environment it's so, great for science it's great it's, uh, it's it, <laughs> so that's another we haven't touched on that but, but one of the truly very good things about Nobel Prize is that because of this unique international renome that it has it makes the press very curious about it right. and they speculate <laughs> who's going to get the prize yeah and then when it when the prize is announced 
you can get science news on the front page of newspapers, prime time television time. And that is important, I mean, because what we achieve in science, that is a, I'm saying that we as scientists can be proud about it also for society at large to be proud of. It's part of our culture. Mm -hmm. We build this immense knowledge that has uh, considerably used in many different contexts. And in, in, in all honesty, science and technology are the prime mover of our society. For sure. And we should be proud of being a part of that. And then because it's not just the scientists that, uh, that should be proud of what they're doing. Society at large should be proud of it. Look at what we can achieve and look at how we, we can, by proper use of these advantages, we can so solve some of the large problems that are confronting us. For Instead sure. of, uh, For sure. of uh, the taking a kind of dismal, dystopic perspective of what happened in global warming and so forth, get in there, use science and technology, and we're going to solve the problems. I remember in 1989 when Bishop and Varmus Prize was announced, I was riding the subway mm -hmm. here in New York, and I saw on the front page of the Daily News, which is a tabloid here in New York City. You know, you could look at you write it, read it like a book, right? So it's easy to read on the bus and the subway. Front page, I saw Michael and... Harold's picture, who I'd known. Isn't that nice? Front page of a, usually yeah. it's murders and crimes it's and politics. Nice. They're all negative news, usually say better than positive news. But yeah. for once, for once it's positive great. news of novels, yeah. since no. they, I think they get great. up there. It's just know. great. Um, back to uh, Nobel Prizes. Um, w one that's quite interesting, which you write about, is the two prizes, uh, Frederick Sanger. Uh -huh. For DNA and protein sequencing, and you hmm. and you said something interesting about chemistry prizes, which is this these were right, both chemistry prizes. Yes, they were. They were. You can't write about them until the recipient has passed. No, here, here is a difference between the prize in physiology or medicine mm -hmm. and in physics and, ke and chemistry. So at the, at the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, we have this principle: you're not allowed to write about someone who's still alive, and. Uh, uh, so when Fredrik Sanger died, then uh, Ted Friedman out in La Jolla arranged a very nice conference uh, with gathered a number of, of, of his students, uh, mm -hmm. including Elizabeth Blackburn and so forth, other Nobel laureates. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that uh, inspired me to, because I was also making a contribution to research Sanger, and, and it was a joy to write about him. And he was a a Quaker, as you know, uh, may know, and uh, he uh, therefore he was exempted from uh, uh, from participating in, in war uh, efforts during the Second World War, and so he could continue his science, and and he broke open a completely new era. As a, today, it's hard to believe for or to anyone involved in molecular biology that there was a time that we didn't know that proteins were kind of homogeneous substances with the same size, with the same amino acid sequence. That was not clear until you, you mm. sang and did the experiment. <laughs> and he did choose uh, the protein that was available in the best quantities and in the purest form, that was insulin. And then he systematically find, found ways of cutting so we didn't know how many chains there were and, and, and so forth. Uh, and so, but cutting them into pieces, see if he could find overlaps. And by that, he could progressively build up. First of all, no, there's not four chains, there are two chains. The two chains have, one is uh, 33 and the other perhaps 29. And, and he could demonstrate an elegant experiment that they were connected by disulfide bridges and so forth. This is such a beautiful piece of work. And once that had been done, the concept was solidified. A, a certain protein can only have the one structure, certain sequence, and that it's predetermined. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so the, and he, he was quite young at, at that time when he got the first prize uh, in chemistry. And then, he, of course, he was a part of the molecular biology laboratory in, in mm -hmm. Cambridge. And like he said, 
Well, you can't be close to uh, Francis Crick without start, starting to think about nuclear assets. So, and progressively, he, so he got interested in that. Could, could you determine the sequence of DNA? And with his technical proficiency and his imagination, he developed a very useful technique to sequence DNA that we then have profited from immensely. There was another technique also, but eventually it was a Sanger technique that was used. Very yeah, humble yeah. person, yeah. turning 65, saying, no, I've done my part, I will retire. <laughs> and he spent his life nursing his garden, building his boats and so forth. Uh, altogether, very, very pleasant person to, to write about, humble. This uh, sequencing is huge because basically Sanger termination, chain termination, is the basis for some of the modern metagenomic sequencing approaches. And we can, we can learn about evolution, we can learn about our genome, other genomes, medicine. It's amazing. Another uh, seminal technique. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's essentially unlimited. And since the same language has been used since the dawn of life, Mm -hmm. We can go all the way back and comparing species and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's a who would have thought that, 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 that one could find such an, 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 an optimal tool to follow evolutionary developments. <laughs> what I find even more remarkable is the technology of ancient DNA recovery and sequencing, where now we can look at Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes, and who knows how old we can go with that. Precisely. Remarkable. So one cannot refrain from mentioning Svante Pierpo, yes. who is a, <laughs> a, a fantastic person in, in this field and has pioneered that, starting out, actually started out as a little of a virologist, looking for hepatitis virus, mm -hmm in mummies and so forth. But he has taken this whole field Amazing. a yeah. long, long way. And I, I wish that every human being in this world knew the simple fact that he or she has a forefather that moved out of Africa 60,000 years ago. It was dark skin and it coming into new habitats, trying to survive and meeting a lot of challenges. What food should I have? Uh, how do I manage whatever climatological uh, uh, challenges and so forth? Because at that time, the word races lose, loses meaning. If we all have the same grandfather, great, great, great grandfather was yes, dark skinned, right. how can we talk about? People that people that look differently belong to different races. It's it's a complete misconception. And we talk about sequence in DNA. So how similar we are. I sure. mean, they, 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 everything just proves that that we are part of the same same origin. There's one out race of, out of Africa. There's only one. Genetically, we are one race. Only one. <laughs> it's true. And and uh, the, this is. Very, very important, and we should keep that in mind. Yes, for sure. Now, in 1982, the, even though we can't have insight from the archives, this prize was to Aaron Klug mm -hmm. for virus structure. Now, I don't think you've written much about him. You've mentioned him in your books, right? Yeah, no, I mentioned him, and, and, and he has been kind to, to comment on some of my previous books also. And uh, so the first thing we should say is that when Franklin Roslin mm -hmm. moved from King's College in end of March 1953, uh, uh, she came in a completely new environment for uh, crystallography uh, with Bernal, and, 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 uh, who was a star in that whole field. And her first student was Aaron Klug. Mm -hmm. And what were they interested in? Virus structure. So she developed the first high quality models of how uh, tobacco mosaic is built up with 16 and one third protein unit per turn mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and its helical structure with the RNA intertwined as a helical in the protein helix. And that was the work by her and Aaron Klug. And when she died, uh, the, the, 
Aaron Clough was a, was, a pri- was a prime inheritance of whatever you call it in English of, of what she had, including her little blue blue car that he didn't drive for the first year. But but anyhow, so he had a very good uh, start in his career, and then has since then developed that in in a beautiful way. And there is, uh, of course, there are uh, the, 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 this. Nice description in in, in uh, current books about the different fields that he and being involved in. That was, mm-hmm. of course, viruses, but many other cellular structure where he played a major, major role. On that. So in virology, he's known for establishing the principles of icosahedral symmetry mm-hmm. and how viruses are built. Precisely, Casper and Klug are the two. Now, uh, this this was a, a chemistry prize, right? It was a chemistry prize, and the and then Wendell Stanley had also received the chemistry prize for tobacco mm-hmm. for crystallizing tobacco mosaic virus, right? Exactly, exactly. So are uh, these are these the only two virology chemistry prizes? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah unless I've forgotten something, I, I think these yeah, are the, the yeah. straightforward vir- virology prizes. They are the two ones. Mm, mm. That's quite interesting. Now, here I want to intersperse uh, a quote from you again. You say, uh, there is no reason to forbid any form of science, but it's important to ensure that there are ethical rules which guarantee that new information is used and not misused. Mm -hmm. Why did you write that? So I think it's important, and that that can, of course, influence what kind of information you seek. But the the key thing is information in itself is not dangerous, but it's the way it's being used. So so we we need to have strict ethical rules for that. And uh, and, uh, my experience is that the scientific community normally is is in the forefront of that. Uh, We have taken our own initiatives, Mm -hmm. like in the early Asilomar conference and so forth. And, And today we are discussing like, what about the, the application of CRISPR-Cas9 and so forth? So, right. so we, we take that responsibility. It's not uh, so they imposed on us from 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 without. Yeah, because as you, you may know, there are some who feel that we shouldn't do certain kinds of experiments. For example, the adaptation of influenza H5N1 to aerosol transmission in ferrets. Mm-hmm. Many people thought this was a Terrible right, experiment, right. but your philosophy would be that we can do them if we regulate them properly. I, uh, yes, I would absolutely okay. say that uh, I cannot think of any, uh, with our present knowledge of anything that that we couldn't really do. We, we, we've learned to work with very dangerous pathogens, yeah, for example, sure. like the last hour and Ebola virus and so forth. So, no, no, it can, it can be controlled. But one has to define when, uh, what is the motivation? Why do I use this system sure, if you're using sure, a dangerous sure. system? Uh, so so uh, one should select the, 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 uh, the least harmful, mm-hmm. the most effective system for the purpose that you're pursuing. You know. Can we talk a little bit about Frank Burnett? I have a book uh, uh, right there on the top, A Life. Frank Burnett, A Life. It's over there. A Life, which, okay, okay. Uh, which is really wonderful. Have you read it? Uh, so I, I have read it. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic book. And one of the first books that I was confronted with as a young virologist was Viruses and Man mm-hmm. that, uh, that Marfana Burnett uh, published in, in the Penguin series in the paperback. I mean, and that was, I think, sold in, in large numbers. Uh, so so Marfana Burnett was an ex- exceptional scientist and uh, he's from Australia, and he was a, like many of, 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 of the scientists that we meet in the context of Nobel Prizes, uh, he was interested in, 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 in nature, and, in, and he, he collected insects and so forth. And, uh, and then he was sent to um, uh, the United Kingdom to get some training, and he picked up on bacteriophages and that is a whole chapter to itself that I would be prefer perhaps to come come back to later when mm-hmm. I've looked into the 1969 prize but McFarlane Bonnet did some truly pioneering and visionary experiment he serologically distinguished different stereotypes of uh, bacteriophages and 
he saw something that must have been what much later on Lwoff called lysogeny, mm. that, that there could be a dormant infection in cell and it could be activated. Mm. Mm. And he used the German term anlage, that is uh, a certain, uh, that it is like a genetic property that is hidden there. He, he could see the writing on the wall. Mm. A couple of decades before it finally was demonstrated to be a phenomenon that's called lysogeny. A phenomenon that, by the way, also took Lwoff by surprise when he finally, finally identified that. Um, but, and then he went back to Australia and pioneered incredible work on influenza virus, on the receptors of that, biochemically to find that. And uh, he did elegant uh, uh, epidemiological work with Marivari fever virus. He was really a trailblazer. Actually, he also was uh, part responsible for distinguishing that there are different serotypes of polyvirus. So he had all these different contributions. And so you, you can imagine that he was nominated for a Nobel Prize in the end of the 40s and through the 50s. And my predecessor, Sven Gard, he became professor of virology in 1948. And from there on, he was a very influential person in the Nobel Committee, as I briefly mentioned. And of course, he wrote about the Burnett and all these different discoveries. Uh, so the only little hang up was this, what, what was Burnett's discovery? What is the, was the, the moment? What, how could one crystallize mm. his, dis his contribution through a, a major discovery? And uh, although Sven, I'm sure, argued, or I've seen the, the reviews very, very strongly for a price to Burnett, it didn't fly. Comes 1959, and now a new phenomena being discussed in immunology, the so-called immunological tolerance. And that is uh, pursued by, by immunologists, Medawars, Billingham and Brent. Uh, by the way, they always had names in alphabetic order. So, so Medawar was never the first author, but that was just one of his rules. And, uh, and, uh, but it was Medawar who was, was the brain behind that. And uh, that evolved then into that maybe we should give a prize for uh, insight into the understanding of the immune tolerance that um, uh, Medavar has achieved. However, in a book in 1949, together with Frank Fenner, there's a one paragraph in which uh, Burnett has formulated precisely the background for immunological torsions. And I don't know if, uh, probably Sven inside must have been, Sven Gard must have known about that big hood. So he brings that forward and say, well, wait a minute, here, here it's been presented in, in its full conceptual form. So let's include Burnett in, in, in it. And uh, so Burnett and Madame Argette, the 1960 mm. prize. And I still remember that. I was a very young, mm. Virologist, I've started in virally 59 and I've started to do some lab laboratory work. And Sved Garden generously invited me to have a dinner in his home together with McFarlane Burnett. Yeah. And you okay. see how inspiring for what Sven called a budding virologist <laughs> to meet this, this giant yeah, sure. who actually on the one to one. Uh, person it was a very pleasant and nice mm. though we talked about. He liked to hands on work I mean, uh, with, with embryonated eggs and he liked to do the manual thing. Actually, he never had a large group and he has the one technician and they did these things together. And, uh, so that was all great. Uh, but of course, much later than Burnett said, well, it was nice to get that prize, but that is for the, the second best thing I've done in immunology. The most important thing is of clonal selection theory. That is much more important than this one paragraph I wrote about immune tolerance, mm. which is true. And when finally, much later, Snell uh, uh, and, and colleagues, including the, the, the Danish colleague, get get their prize, and then he, he sends a, a, a telegram saying that, that yes. 
uh, it's good that you now have this pride, but you and I should have shared that. And uh, but be that as may, now we are Nobel lords, both of us. And so you write about um, Burnett a bit, saying he had a disdain for molecular techniques, and and you speculate perhaps because it's difficult to make dramatic new hypotheses as work focuses on finer and finer details. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting thought because that's what we do today, of course. Yeah, we that's have what we do. And, and, uh, and I don't, I'm not sure I can be that categorical. Uh, mm -hmm. If you talk about like reverse transcripts, I mean, that is a refined chemical tool and we open up a completely new, uh, yeah. new field. So what I think when I read that, I think today, you know, we can sequence entire genomes, transcriptomes, we can sequence all the RNA in cells under different conditions. And that's what a lot of people do, but they don't formulate a hypothesis. Oh, that's right. And that's what he's talking about. He wanted to do simple experiments, but first make a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And then do a simple experiment. And, and he says, says now as the techniques get more detailed, we don't make hypotheses, we just start collecting data. And if he were around today, he would see this is even more true. That's my opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's certainly so. I sometimes refer to that as, as horizontal and vertical research. Uh, research. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. horizontal research, you apply well-established technology to the well-defined problem, and like that, I'm going to just determine the, the nucleotide sequence yeah. or this part of the yeah. species or something like that. But there's something that could call vertical research also, is where you where you dare to go into the unknown to another right. other extent. And, right. and today, of course, or it will always hold true. The vertical research is what we're doing. You, you must be dare to skin a little on, on the thin ice and, and, and take risks and, and of course fail. Science is a lot about failing. I mean, but, right. but, uh, and the uh, other qualities that, or terms that we often use is that sometimes it's good to be, be obsessed. I mean, I, 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 I think I have this hypothesis, I'm going to hang on to it. And, uh, and mm -hmm. maybe if you're lucky, there's a breakthrough. In that. I want to just mention um, what seem to be very infrequent awards, awards for new viruses, virus discovery. So, you know, throughout time, many viruses have been discovered, but only a few have received Nobel Prizes. 1976, Blumberg for hepatitis B mm -hmm. virus. Mm -hmm. And of course, in 2008, Zurhausen for papillomaviruses, mm -hmm. another another cancer-causing virus. Because yeah, the fact that they were cancer-causing. Mm -hmm. I guess both of those were prizes because they're cancer viruses, not just any virus, right? Because we had lots of other viruses. Oh, that's right. uh, so uh, the Bloomberg's finding, it, that is just a bona fide f uh, identification of the virus that caused Hepatitis B, which was an yeah. enigma for a long, long time. Okay. I mean, we, I mean, they, they, it was, it took a long time to dissect virus induced hepatitis, uh, but, uh, we have to give you a little, little background there. Of course, hepatitis A, the acute form, mm. that we could, could be tracked on quite effectively. And we had, still have today, uh, a sport in Sweden that's very popular, the cross country, Running, I mean, you run through the forest with a, with a compact and find your way to different stations and so forth. Turned out in the 60s that there were uh, flare ups of cases of hepatitis mm -hmm. after these sport events. So, uh, a Swede by the name of Olaf Ring did the epidemiology of this, and you could hear it that the day of competition, then whoop. <laughs> after uh, X number of, in, um, you could see the incubation yeah. time. Right that. So what are they? That meant, oh, it must be spread by blood. And uh, and so one <laughs> changed the conditions and asked that those who were running in, 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 in among these bushes so, to take on long pants. And, uh, and the infection disappeared. So here you could see, so here's one kind of hepatitis. But then we had this other form that was very, very confusing. And uh, Baruch Bloomberg, who was not a virologist, he was a serologist. It was interesting comparing uh, different groups of, of humans to see if he could find uh, markers 
that were related to to various ethnic groups and so forth. And he did it in Australia, and then he found something that uh, he called them because of that it's existent Australia antigen. But there was something strange about it, and I'm not sure how he really got at that. But he, he finally understood that no, this this must be due to some infectious agent. Mm-hmm. So he had to go back to the fundamental textbooks of virology. How do you study viruses? What do you do? And so on. And step by step, of course, they could identify that what they found was not indigenous host characteristic blood cell proteins, but was a foreign antigen, and that was due to an infection with hepatitis B. So I think it, it it's a beautiful story, and, and the fact that he as a virologist could track this down, I mean, it, it's... Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and then, then later, when, of course, we learned to know that this was just the surface antigen of the virus, and there were, for many years, a little, uh, consternation about what about this does the virus look like. And uh, electron microscopists did very nice work on that, June Almeida and, and other people, and eventually understood that happened. And that then also uh, of course came back to the fantastic story of how in the early use of yellow fever vaccine, mm. you had in a not uh, too limited frequency, uh, in, in uh, you caused uh, jaundice. I mean, so what was going on? And later on, we understood that when using human albumin to stabilize the virus because it was a live vaccine, and apparently, uh, that uh, albumin could be contaminated with hepatitis B, but it took 20 years before we really understood that. But there was a large number of uh, of, uh, of hepatitis in uh, yellow fever vaccinated soldiers during the U.S. It was yeah. a major problem, and it, it was finally deduced that it may have been due, been due to that one added this human proteins to stabilize the the uh, the live vaccine and then when I, if i have my story right one exchange that for another protein and and these complications disappeared but the, it was not easy to track down mm. but as people we were not uh, really uh, f- uh, f- fully inside into this type of persistent infection and uh, we didn't have any the useful uh, Markers that, that we could mm. could use for this. Molecular okay. biology, of course, is, uh, is uh, later on uh, open up unique possibilities to track down new viruses, and then we sure, become sure. very very skilled at that, which of course gives us security when you're going to handle mm. emerges, uh, emerging infections or, or unexpected new. Epidemics or something. So over the over years, many important viruses have been discovered: yellow fever, polio, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, etc. The herpes viruses. Yet each does not get a Nobel Prize. So I'm I'm often puzzled at Hep B and and human papilloma viruses, important viruses, but um, I don't know why it's different. Well, from so if others. you're and um, not so in that prize in '76. We combined that with mm-hmm. Carlton Gard's discovery of those exceptional, very stable, atypical infectious agents. I see. And and uh, and the way, and I'm going to say that the way I formulated that was the introduction of new principles in the uh, field of infectious diseases, because the chronic okay. hepatitis B was, was an, a new principle of that viruses could persist in mm-hmm. this. Form and, and, and yeah. Now, what about page, human papilloma viruses? It wasn't the first human cancer virus. No, right? so the human papilloma viruses, the Sir Hausen's critical contribution was that and he was not the one to, to discover papilloma virus. I'm not even sure who that was. Or it was, I know, was a very important person in the, mm. uh, but, but that can be tracked down also. For, but to progressively, when I might identify a large number of different papilloma viruses, and uh, the critical thing that that Sir Hausen did was to identify that that certain types have a relationship to dysplasia or to to transforming of cells, in the, and therefore might have been the cause of, of cancer. And 
12, 18, 31, and so forth. Okay. And systematically analyzing that. And, and, and the beauty of that is that, that having identified this, this causative relationship, so you can now develop vaccine and you can immunize and you can prevent the emergence of cancer by mm -hmm. a vaccination that specifically prevents infection with certain papilloma okay. viruses. And that is a major contribution. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, the, we talked a lot about tumor viruses and tumors here. And uh, generally, we we say that some, maybe some 15 to 20 percent of all tumors mm -hmm. have some involvement of, of cancer. And uh, the discovery of the role of papilloma viruses is so important because it allows us to develop the vaccine and to prevent cancer. Okay. Right the cancer vaccine. Okay. And if there are other similar situations, I find it hard to, at this stage to, to, to really define. We may find other tumor viruses, but they should, of course, there, there must be a certain prevalence if I would mm. uh, motivate some general vaccination and so forth. Of course, at the same time, as Zurhausen and the HIV discovery was given to Barry Sinusi and Montagnier. Mm -hmm. can, I can understand that, the biggest pandemic of our time. That's sure. right. Oh, yeah. No, so that, that was very, very important. Yeah, because then you can make diagnostics and therapies and so forth, which is desperately needed to save lives, and which we can do now. And we have been exceedingly successful in making antivirals yes. because of the fact that we have all these tools to identify the complexity of the genes, the way they interrelate. And, and the important thing, I think, when you use antivirals is that, uh, so since viruses are the sloppy as they replicate, they rapidly can develop resistance to a single drug. Sure. Uh, but if you, and as one of, it's been possible to do with HIV, identify different targets for various antiviral mm -hmm. substances, mm -hmm. then all by suddenly, if you, if you use three different drugs, it's essentially impossible for the virus to mute it simultaneously in these three places and escape the, the treatment. So, so here, this fundamental knowledge we have about the genomic structure, the different number of critical uh, structural uh, or different gene products, possibilities to interfere in different mechanisms. It, it, this very uh, in-depth insight into how these comp relatively complex viruses replicate puts tools in our hands to, to develop antivirus, and, and, and we've been successful in that. And I must say that I think it's wonderful that Barre, Sinusi, and Montagnier received the prize. They isolated the virus first a year ahead of their other competitors. Mm -hmm. And so it is, I'm so happy that the, that the Nobel uh, people recognize this. That's and as right. you know, there are controversies over the discovery. There are indeed. And these and are the and ones and who discovered it. Yeah, no, not everyone was happy about that, but we don't need to repeat that story. No, it's no. a well-known story of Robert Gallo and so forth. But I think these are the two that Knowing, if you know, they published ahead a year ahead of anyone else. So, yeah. but if we talk about Bogallo, then you could, if you, you should give him credit, he was the first one to identify you, HTLV one and two and sure. three, three and four, uh, and uh, these are very very important cont contributions. And had this virus had a more general I I importance, I mean, they are the mostly in selected populations. Sure. And they cause uh, sometimes tumors, but in relatively low frequency. They can also cause, in some cases, neurological disease. So, had they had another medical impact in terms of a broader context of who they mm -hmm. they, they are, can infect and then what they do, uh, maybe one should have tried to develop vaccines for them. Maybe this would be in the same class as mm. discovering papilloma viruses. So, so Gallo should have credit for that, and and also. The reason he could do that was that he was also the original inventor of interleukin-2 and one of those important... For growing uh, T-cells in culture. Yeah. yeah, for growing white blood cells in culture. So. Well, as you say also, there is only one prize a year. Mm. And even though there are many worthy discoveries, not all can be recognized, right? No, no. And uh, the field of... If you, if you compare the size of, uh, let's, let's say, the 
uh, on medical uh, research in, in the 1901 <laughs> until the present time. Uh, there's <laughs> yeah. an enormous yeah. expansion. For sure. For sure. And, uh, but, but the nice thing about the Nobel Prize, because, and I would like to, to praise the colleagues who have tried to make all these evaluations as objective as I can, is that the Nobel Prizes describe the history of science. Mm. I, I can give a series of popular lectures by describing the advances in modern medicine using Nobel Prizes as milestones. They, it is that they have an historical impact. Sure. I mean, if it's Absolutely. done right, they should mark out these discoveries that dramatically change the mm -hmm. possibilities we have to, to, to care for people with various kinds of, of um, diseases. And if we reflect on what advances we have made, they are immense like the polio vaccine, you can take many examples. So quality of life is increasing, average lifespan is increasing. Um, a lot of this is uh, to the credit of very good science, and we should be proud of that. And the human civilization should be proud of that, because they, it, we, we, do, we do the things that we enjoy doing, the, the fun we have in our science being paid for that, I mean, from tax money, that's mm -hmm. quite, or from other sources. Uh, something to be grateful for. Is there any particular scientist who is deserving of a prize that didn't get one that is worthy of mention? No, that that would be very hard to select than anyone in, in particular. There is, no, that, that I would find that. You mentioned some people in your talks that should have received prizes but didn't um, and I don't remember their names now but they were very close and, and you can see in the deliberations that they were yeah, nominated yeah. many many times but never quite made it right mm -hmm. no there, there are of course a lot of examples on that but um, and you had already emphasized that it's just the one prize yeah. per year and and we have by the way the tradition has evolved we have maximized the number of slots to three so so we can only give to selected, and clearly yeah. there must be, I mean, no, 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 fields that are not covered, uh, that one could argue that could be covered. Huh? In one of your books you write, CRISPR-Cas9 has not yet been recognized by a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So what, what has to be done? The, the technology exists. What would have to happen to be considered for a Nobel Prize? I don't even care who gets it. It's just, does the field have to progress some more? Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, I don't think I can give a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, they, 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 uh, they, I know it's a complex story about finding the right priorities and, mm -hmm. and the use, and uh, there's some ethical debates. So uh, we'll simply let time work on mm -hmm. that and see what happens. It will be no, non, no doubt a contentious prize because you can only give it to three and there are more than three people involved in the whole story. Uh, here, right? there, there are a number of examples of that where yeah. we have, yeah. where we get, uh, uh, we, we may have this, these four names and we cannot remove one yeah. and, and that blocks the prize. <laughs> Tough. Um, what's the role of workaholism, obsession, and genius uh, in the pursuit of science? And are all the prize winners have those qualities? No, I think it's hard to generalize. But, but I think that uh, you have to be a little obsessed. I mean, you mm -hmm. you must have this feeling that 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 that, that you you hang on to this problem. You have a feeling that uh, there are possibilities for a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and, and you also, I would emphasize, you need to have a pretty stable psyche because there are all these ups and downs. And, ups mm -hmm. and, downs. and mo mm -hmm. very often, most of the experiments are negative. And, yeah, uh, for sure. So, so you, it's a question of not, not giving up. I mean, I mean, uh, so we, we mentioned now, uh, if you want to have a prototype, Howard Terman to me is a typical, uh, I mean, it's so genuine. He was so obsessed. He knew that there must be something, although he couldn't articulate that what it was, mm -hmm. but he hangs on to the problem. Techniques develop and finally he is proven right. 
So, so that they, that's uh, it's very good of a, a devoted uh, scientist, I think. You know, you can be devoted, but you still have to get funded, and so you're at the mercy of how long the funding will last. Yeah. And, but in the old days, I think it was easier to pursue a, an idea longer. And nowadays, I think it's hard. I think you have five years, and if you don't come up with something, you're, you, you won't renew your grant. Yeah, no, that, that's a typical American ex expression. Uh, there's a jungle out there. And, and, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I think that's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, yes, you have to be a bit prepared to, first of all, develop a belief in your own capacity. No, I can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, find the right problem. The other thing we should emphasize is also how you select your mentor. It's very critical that you can can be in in an environment where you learn to know the the the, the ethics of, of scientific conduct and the 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 whole psychology of that. Uh, we used to generalize and say that half of all Nobel prizes have worked in laboratories of other Nobel prizes. Half, well, half. That's remarkable. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if that uh, still applies, but but previously that was the case. I mean, mm. And, and a good number were also in a family. I know the. the, the oh, that that's interesting. I, I don't. I can't think of one offhand. Can you? Kornberg. So the Kornbergs both received. That's right. Okay. The father and son, and mm -hmm. that. That's right. Uh, the Swede Siegborn. There are mm -hmm. two of them, Mamane and Kai Siegborn. And there are uh, additional examples. Not too many, though. Right? No. No, but that's, that's and true. And then how many uh, have received two? No, but I know Curie and Fred Sanger, the ones I know. Yeah, there is some in, in physics. Bardeen, I think, is one okay. of them. And, and, okay. uh, but, uh, but, of course, that is very uncommon. Uh, you point out in your books that in natural sciences, the Nobel recipients with a Jewish background are overrepresented by 100-fold. Mm -hmm. To what do we ascribe that? Do, is it because the certain cultural, ethnic background encourages? So it, 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 like it is so striking. 25% of the prize recipients in physics, 16% in chemistry, and 25% in physiology or medicine. And uh, so it's remarkable. If it was a factor of two, three, or four, but not what we were talking about. We're talking about factor 100. There must genuinely be something in the culture. And of course, being a group in diaspora, you could say, yes, you prioritize knowledge. Knowledge is, as I, uh, uh, I think I wrote in the, in the last book, it's easy to carry. <coughs> and knowledge, it's a fantastic asset to have as you interact with mm -hmm. other human beings. You can trade knowledge for new knowledge. And uh, it doesn't uh, cause greed. I mean, the knowledge is <coughs> has its own satisfaction and, and you know, yeah, joy. Sure, sure. And but that's it. But there's something more in, in this, and I wish I could get some insight in that. I know that the Jewish religion is different, also. One does not abide with uh, that whatever is said in, 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 in the Torah is true. In fact, one is allowed to discuss and debate every part in contradistinction to what you have in the Bible. So, so one could think about several different uh, uh, aspects or oh, some things that something that could be important. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah, no, I uh, but but again, People with a Jewish ethnic background, they're not overachievers only in science, but also in, mm -hmm. in the arts, mm -hmm. the music, and what have you. So, and I don't think it's genetic. Yeah. But that that yeah. can be called debated, but I don't yeah. think so. I think it's the environment. All right, two more questions. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, I'm, I'm amazed reading your books, how mm -hmm. many scientists who won Nobel Prizes at one point went to the United States as part of their training. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in my travels, when I talk to people, so many have spent some time in the U.S. It was, Absolutely. we had a very open culture <clears throat> of science in this country for many, many years. 
But remember then, this is a post-Second World War phenomenon. Before the Second World yes. War, uh, there was a limited number of American Nobel Prize recipients, and it was dominated by the UK and Germany, mm -hmm. and to some extent France. So there was this uh, European tradition, and then in, in particular Germany. And it, one can just take notice that uh, the, the very sad story, how one managed to erase such a national capacity by a terrible ideology that, that, uh, mm. that took away, and, and that in addition, said, I mean, was what anti-Semitic and so forth. I mean, what, what was drawn to the, the German, uh, the, the German nation in the 1930s? Probably took some hundred years to repair. The Germany is coming back, of course, but it was a, a tragedy without mm. any measure somehow. Of course, the post-World War, uh, increase in U.S. No laureates was a consequence of our increased investment in science. But then at the same time, many people came to this country to be trained. Yeah, and it was I, a combined effect of all this. But in all fairness, you said that, uh, that, that your investments in science and technology has really paid off. So the general uh, estimated about 70% of all prices in the natural science goes to this country. Remarkable. And this is something that you should be very careful about. You have unique academic environments and mm. you have a lot of things to be be proud of in what, what contributions you have made. And, yeah. and I just hope that you can hold that up because the the new knowledge that you gain here is of value for the whole world. Sure. And that for sure. is knowledge knows no borders. And the, 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 the trade off of what the achievements we make knows no borders. We live in a global world. And therefore, we're the, the, one should be very careful. About it. We'll see what future competition has in store. Mm -hmm. I mean, Asia is coming strong, and uh, uh, but I can only encourage you and your nation here to let, be proud of what you have achieved and, and try to keep the quality of your research up on that level and, and, because it's the benefit of everyone. For sure. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you. Um, at the end of your talk you today you recited a haiku that you had written. Do you remember it? Can you say it? Yeah, I do. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I think that my last three books, I like to introduce each chapter with a haiku. And that's a quite it's kind of minimalistic approach. That is that uh, there's a five, seven, five uh, syllables that you, you're allowed to mm -hmm. use. And now, so in the final chapter of the, 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 the latest book, uh, I cannot refrain from uh, reflecting on themes that are a little besides the, the, the whole theme of the book. Uh, so it's called To See the Invisible. So I write about the electron microscope that we have discussed a little. And, and I originally had that in another part of the book because Ernst Ruska, who received this prize after 50 years, was in about the same position, like Peyton Rouse. I thought an interesting analogy. But uh, so I write about the electron microscope, but then also about the RNA world. Because if, if anything is exciting to us virologists, it mm -hmm. is the RNA world. Uh, we have all these RNA viruses mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we gradually underst understand must in some way be a reflection of what was way, way back. And there's more and more data accumulating on, on the role of, of RNA. And if I was to select a molecule to admire, it is the RNA molecule. Isn't it remarkable here you have, can have an information context based on the sequence of the nucleotides that you have? On the same time, you can, by forming internal base for pairing, form three-dimensional structures mm. that can serve various catalytic functions. It is so 
elegant I and mean, so fantastic. And so it's clear that that is how life must have begun in this world with, with the, this RNA world. And what came after that? Well, uh, one can see, I think, that proteins form using this 20 amino acid, of course, by definition, allowed a much wider uh, range of enzymatic functions. So, for, so taking steps that, that, that they probably involve some proteins. But then there's, there's a recent finding of, a, or a recent construct of an RNA that can function as a reverse transcriptase. So then you can build DNA. And uh, it's, it's open to anyone then to speculate in which order this all developed. But there's no doubt about the fact that RNA has a primary role. So this is a long background <laughs> to this very, very simple haiku where I actually, uh, in a way, vulgarized what, what T.S. Eliot have written in the wasteland. And, and that is a classical text saying, so did the world end, or shall the world end, not with a bang, but with a whimper, which is a uniquely elegant formulation, even if it may not be true. But uh, So my little haiku simply said, so did the world start with a humble RNA, not with DNA. That's it's great. I love it. No, it's a little playing with words somehow. All right. You can find TWIV at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can listen on any podcast player, phone, or tablet. Please subscribe so you get every episode. Send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And consider supporting our work. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. My guest, uh, his return visit has been from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Sci from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, Erling Norby. Thank you so much for coming. It's a great joy to join you, and <laughs> um, I'm pleased that we can share our enthusiasm with the colleagues out there. And I hope to see you again uh, for your next book. We'll, we'll do this again. We're pleased to. I'm Vincent Racaniello. Uh, you can find me at virology.ws. I want to say uh, Erling has published four different books on uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, including Nobel Prizes in Life Sciences, Nobel Prizes in Notable Discoveries, Nobel Prizes in Nature's Surprises. And the last one is called Nobel Prizes-Cancer, Vision, and the Genetic Code. Go buy them. All of them. They're very good. I've read all of them. Well, I haven't read the new one. I read one chapter, uh, but now I have a copy I shall read. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Virology.